Okay, so I, I do want to take us to the end here. Uh, I, I do think these are fascinating times. You know, as I said, there are big issues about, about the impact of this chaotic information environment on our lives, you know, on the little things, the decisions we make, you know, toilet seat up, toilet seat down, parking the car, taking, getting your kid, kids to school, but also the big stuff. Like we know it's having an impact, as I said earlier, on vaccination hesitancy. It's had an impact on we, how we perceive climate change. It's having an impact on a lot of things. And, and, and of course, of course, on our politics. And there are a lot of forces that have got us to this place, as I've already talked about the role of anxiety and fear in this context. And I, and I think what we need to do here is, is, is recognize our own cognitive biases and, and the impact that it can have and how we interpret uh, those feelings. Um, and, and I think we also should take steps to try to reduce those feelings in our lives. And I'll, I'll come to that. Um, there has been a reduction in trust. Uh, this is a tough one. You know, the idea of trust is, is complex, uh, but in the aggregate, in fact, there was a recent study from, from Canada, very recent, just a couple of days ago, that really talked about this sort of global reduction in, in trust. There is really interest as a result of the pandemic, really interesting kind of conflicting data about how we view science and scientists. But I think it is fair to say there has been a sort of reduction in trust globally. There has been an increased polarization in public discourse, for sure. A lot of really interesting research about that and the impact that that has had on how we interpret research, how, how, we, how we share information on, on the internet, the, the, the idea that we're starting to form increasingly these echo chambers and we just listen to people who have the same views as us. This is a real problem. There's been fascinating work on it. And of course there is this disruptive technologies, right? And by that, I'm, I mean largely, but not entirely social media, right? Social media has really changed um, how we distribute information. You know, in our own research, we have found that, that the current infodemic is largely, not entirely, but largely a social media phenomenon. Yes, misinformation is coming from other sources, from friends, et cetera, but, but social media really has transformed how we get our information. And so has search engines, right? When you want to find something out, you, you plug your, you know, your request into a search engine and that has an impact uh, that has an impact on on how you perceive the world, right? I, I often like to joke that search engines create our universe. It's true. You know, most people don't go past the first page. You know, I think it's 93% of people never leave the first page of search results. And those search results have been tailored for you, right? And they are they are skewing how you see the universe. And remember that when you get when you get your uh, search results. And, and, and the other thing we have to recognize is there is increasingly actors trying to sell us stuff. And I always like to say they're trying to sell us bunk whether they're trying to sell us a, a bunk product. You know, I do research in the context of health and I can tell you that is increasingly the case. Um, they're trying to sell us ideology. They're trying to sell us brands. Always be aware of that. So then the question becomes, we have all these cultural forces. What can we do about it? You know, I, well, I hope, I hope this comes up in, in, the, in our q and I'd love to hear your thoughts if you have questions about what you can do about it. But let me give you a couple of the, the big themes I talk about in the book, and they're obvious, you guys. I know they're obvious, uh, but it's important to recognize them. The first is, yes, yes, you probably, yes, I was gonna say this. We need to increase our critical thinking skills. We absolutely do. As I said earlier, we need to think about what kind of evidence is being used to support uh, that, that proposition. Um, we need to ask ourselves, is there an agenda at play? Is someone trying to sell me something? Is hyperbole being used? You know, there. We need to do that. And the good news is there is good studies that suggest that if you, if you do that, you can make a difference. Uh, there have been studies that have talked about the impact of critical thinking and have found that increasing critical thinking skills, whether you're talking about kids, you know, I'm talking kindergarten, you know, elementary school, junior high, high school, it can, you can make a difference. Um, there was a study done in Africa on kids in, in Uganda. I believe the kids were 11 years old. They taught them critical thinking skills. They, were, they learned them and they were able to apply them and it made a real difference. We need to do more of that, obviously, obviously. And the other thing that we need to do, and this has been a theme uh, in, in much of my career, you know, the decades of work that I've done in this space, more often than not, you can rely on and turn back to those science-informed basics. So what do I mean by that? You know, you can ignore, in almost all spheres of life, you can ignore that chaotic information environment and really focus on the science informed basics, focus on that body of evidence. 
So when we're talking about, for example, let's just use this as an example, trying to live a healthy lifestyle. You know, we know what that looks like, despite the fact that the wellness industry is a multi-trillion dollar industry trying to sell you stuff constantly. We know what the basics of a healthy lifestyle look like. You don't smoke. In fact, if you smoke, almost nothing else matters. You don't smoke, right? You get exercise and there's no magic there. As I said earlier, you know, find something you like and do it often, right? You eat, a, you eat a real food. Again, despite all the noise around nutrition, I talked about, about coffee, no magic here, right? You know, you eat lots of fruits and vegetables, you eat whole grains, you eat healthy proteins. There really is no magic in the long-term studies Tell us that for most people, right? Uh, what else do you do? Um, you try to maintain a healthy weight. This one's a tough one, and, and I, I know that. When, and we also have to recognize we all come in different shapes and sizes, and, and we can be healthy in those different shape, shapes and sizes. You get a good night's sleep. You know, there's an increasing body of evidence to tell us how, how important getting a good night's sleep is. Uh, you take those obvious preventative steps. You know, what, is, what does that mean? Uh, that means that you you know, you get vaccinated, you wash your hands, you know, you wear a seatbelt, just the obvious big stuff, they make a difference, right? Um, and the lastly, you, you know, surround yourself with a great community, surround yourself with people you love. And there, that's it. You know, there really is no magic. And it's the same for almost any topic that you're thinking about. Always, you can almost always go back to those science informed basics. And that's liberating you guys, it allows you to kind of ignore, ignore the noise. But of course, I want to end with, with this, the idea that we also need to relax. We need to relax. Uh, and why do I say this is a public service announcement? Because relaxing and reflecting and pausing, it's not only good for you, and there's really interesting research that suggests that this is the case if you relax. And by that, I mean things like you know, middle, simple stat strategies, like stepping away from the chaotic information environment every once in a while. That means putting down your phone, right? You know, not looking at social media after nine o'clock, for example, giving yourself breaks throughout the day. That's good for your mental health. That's also good for your critical thinking skills. And there's a, an increasing body of evidence that suggests that this is the case. I, I mentioned Gordon Pennycook. He's a, a colleague that works on our infodemic study that we're doing right now. His work has found that just inviting people to pause, inviting people to reflect, reduces their likelihood of spreading misinformation online, but also allows them to be better at assessing the content that they're viewing online. So relaxing is a good, it's not just good for you, it's not good for you, it's good for your community. So that's why it's a public service announcement. <laughs> Relax, reflect, and enjoy. Uh, and with that, with that, I'm gonna say, thank you very, very much for the opportunity to talk to you today. I hope you have some good questions. Uh, and Luke, I want to end with my, my two favorite words. Uh, and that, of course, is go science. Thanks very much. Look forward for your, uh, to your comments. Go science. Love it. Um, thank you so much, Tim, for that, for that whistle-stop tour. Um, and also, as a personal thing, I think we should ban PowerPoints forever in favor of A4 sheets of paper. Love that. <laughs> um, so we're now going to go on to audience questions. So audience, that is your cue. Please type any you have in the box below. Um, so the first one to come in very early on was from Alex, and um, it says, do you acknowledge that 28% of your audience here tonight believes the Bill Gates cons uh, COVID conspiracy theory, which you mentioned at the beginning? And I think that sort of just follow up for me. You've talked about what people should be convinced by, but, but how do you convince people? Obviously, you know, identity resistance is a big thing. If there was someone in our audience right now that believes, say, anti-vax, things like that, what would you say to them? What is your PSA right now? So for, first of all, about that, about that 28%, and I think this is embedded in that question. I do, you know, I, I said this, uh, I think a number of times, we've got to be careful not to overinterpret that because I don't believe that that 28% is really hardcore believers. I think those are individuals that are open to the idea and they may have seen the question and they go, yeah, that, that sounds plausible. Um, so if it's an individual that is part of the movable middle, right? The individual saying, you know what, that sounds plausible. I think there is an opportunity to change their minds. And this is actually an area where we're doing a lot of research. Um, the good news is you guys, it may not feel like this, but debunking does work. It really does work. It may not feel like it. Um, so what do I mean by that? You know, using good shareable content from sources that are, are trustworthy and reflecting on what the body of evidence says 
can make a difference. So you do that. You, you share the good, trustworthy information and you highlight the rhetorical tricks that are used to spread the misinformation. So you say, you know, they're misrepresenting risk or that's just an anecdote. That's not the body of evidence oh, or that's a conspiracy theory. You do those two things. And there've been a number of studies that suggest you can make a difference. Look, Luke, we're talking about moving the dial. You know, the person in front of you is not going to go, you know, now that you mention it, Luke, uh, you're right. That never happens. Right? <laughs> that never happens. But you hope that over time and in the aggregate, you're going to have you're going to have that impact. The other really important thing that comes up in this question and, and um, is this. It is very difficult to change the minds of those hardcore deniers. Right. And so should we waste our time on those individuals? And the answer is largely no. Uh, the World Health Organization, their rule number one, their rule number one for dealing with uh, anti-vaxxers is don't waste your time on the hardcore deniers because it is just so hard to change their minds. And Luke, you, you touch on this in your, in your, in your question, in your, in your reformulation of the question. Once it becomes part of your personal identity, right? Once it becomes part of who you are, it is much more difficult to change their minds. Now, having said all of that, and, and also the good news is I am ever the optimist. <laughs> I like to believe that those hardcore deniers, despite what we're seeing, you know, uh, are, remain a relatively small percentage of the population. I like to believe that movable middle is still, is still pretty large. But, but unfortunately, those spreading misinformation are increasingly playing to ideology. So they'll talk about choice. They'll talk about liberty, liberty you know, the anti-maskers, the anti-vaxxers. And there's really interesting research that suggests that if that's your entry point into a community, the, the ideology, you're, you're, less, you're more likely to sort of ignore the science and, and you're more likely to become part of that community. And that's, so the lesson there is we've got to get on the misinformation quickly, right? It may, even if it seems absurd, before it takes on that ideological spin. So I, I think people probably didn't take the Bill Gates thing you know, seriously, <laughs> who's going to believe that? And then it became too, too late. It became part of this ideological community. The 5G thing is an example of that too. I, I, there have actually been studies on this so suggesting that we should have got on that bit of misinformation very, very quickly before it became part of a broader conspiracy. Uh, and so there are other examples. So debunking works, do it well. The other thing is to listen, be empathetic, be humble, um, and, and you, can, you can make a difference. An excellent, an excellent answer, of course. Um, so KR says, it's not much a question, but, but, but I have one. Uh, it, KR says, it was a concern once that if women rode bikes, they would forget how to walk. Um, I, I think, you know, if you had to pick one or two things that future generations will look back on and give a wry smile, um, maybe some of the things in your book, you know, what, what seems particularly quaint as a, as a worry that we have? I, I think it is going to be around, it's going to be around cell phones. Uh, and, you know, smartphones. I, I really do. I, I totally agree with this point. And, and funny thing is I, I was going to include that in my book, <laughs> this, uh, that example. And they, they thought a bunch of other things about bikes and, and women, as you probably know. Um, uh, I think it's going to be around um, smartphones. And, and I alluded to this when I did my bad drawing of the printing press. Um, I, so, you know, um, uh, there, a lot of people think, you know, looking at your, is fubbing, is that what's called? You know, where you look at your phone and you're having a conversation with people. I think we're going to see this fascinating evolution of social norms, you know, around phones and what's what's considered rude and what's considered not rude. Um, and we're going to laugh at people uh, who once thought that, you know, it's rude to take out your phone. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I think that we're already starting to see that evolution. You know, you're starting to see it appear in TV shows and it's becoming just how humans interact now. You know, they're texting someone while they're talking to another person. So I, I think we're going to look back in the future at some of our quaint concerns around phones and that, and that we are going to need to focus on the things that really have, have done harm. You know, there is, there used to be um, concern about the idea, the belief that, you know, reading was bad. It was rude to read in public. And you know, from a history perspective, I know you're a history buff. There's some questions about the veracity of that, whether that's been overplayed, that that actually was a concern. But for sure, you see these, these social norms. You know, in the section on, in the book on binging, I talk about this bathroom I use all the time. And every time I go into the washroom, it's only got one stall and there's always a guy in there and he's binging a TV show while he's going number two. And it drives me nuts. Right? <laughs> it drives me nuts. Uh, and, and I'm mad at him. I think how rude, but if he was binging, like if he was reading Tolstoy, would I think the same about him? Right. Or if he was, 
if he was binging, you know, the, you know, Wagner's The Ring, you know, uh, would I still think it was? So I, I do think we're going to see an evolution of, of norms around these kinds of, of, of media. And, and I've got to check it myself every once in a while, being so judgy. Personally, if I if I walked into a bathroom and I heard you know the ride of the Valkyries coming out of a bathroom <laughs> stall, I'd be horrified. But but that's just me. Um, <laughs> okay, so so Kim says, uh, and I think it's 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 off the back of that one actually. Do you believe that COVID um, in particular will destroy or demote any of the worries that you talk about in your book? I remember you, you say at one point that the five second myth might might be a, a casualty. It, just speak about that a little bit, please. Yeah. So. In the UK version of my book, I actually have an, an, an afterword. So in the, uh, it came out a little earlier in, in uh, the United States and in Canada and other countries. And, and you guys were the, the last on. So I had time to put it in a pandemic afterward. And I kind of reflect on these things. So thank you for the question. So uh, I'll do this really quickly. I know we don't have a lot of time. I think it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with handshakes. In the book, I, I talk about how there has been this really... Some people suggest, and I'm skeptical sometime of this evolutionary biology talk, but th that we're evolutionarily predisposed to touching uh, during our welcomes and therefore we, you know, we're compelled to come back to it. Um, I, I think it's gonna be really interesting to see what happens post pandemic with the handshake. Uh, Luke, I'm betting, and maybe we can meet up again in a couple of years, I'm betting it's gonna be the fist bump. I, Cause I think it's sort of a happy medium between, you know, not touching at all and having this kind of, and it was already kind of getting a little cultural currency before the pandemic. So uh, I'm get, so that's an interesting one. I'm not a hugger. I'm talking to a new person in the UK. I'm guessing you're not a hugger. So I think maybe hugs are, <laughs> are gone. I think hugs are gone. I think the five second rule, I think that's probably gone for, <laughs> gone for a while. Uh, so I do think the pandemic is going to happen. But the other interesting thing is the pandemic has kind of heightened all of the kind of social concerns, you know, the idea, impact of fear, the impact of social media, the impact of polarization. All of those forces I talk about in the book, you know, have, got, have gone to next level over the past year. And that was fascinating for me to watch. Fantastic. Uh, for the record, I'm, I'm a hugger. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Adam says it's quite an interesting one. Um, it's relatively well established that telling someone to calm down or relax when they're upset or anxious rarely helps. And in fact, it sometimes hinders. Is there some necessary antagonism to your approach? Do you need that, a sort of ice water bath? Um, you know, your book is full of this stuff, the sort of, you're wrong about this. You know, how do you, how do you, how do you wrestle with that? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and I hope when you read, it's a really good question. I thought about it when I was writing, writing the book. And I hope this comes across. The book... I, I don't try to tell people you're right, you're wrong, right? And stop being anxious, you know? Um, I, Cause I think this question is correct. You know, that's, that's never a good strategy. You know, sometimes I do when I get, you know a little bit um, <laughs> wound up about it. Uh, but I, I think it's always better to invite people to, to consider the evidence. Uh, I think it's always, almost always better to listen. I think it's almost always better to be em empathetic with their position. Um, and, and I hope that, you know, a lot of the chapters, as you, as you know, Luke, it's sort of built around these little chapters. A lot of the chapters don't say, this is what you should do, right? There's some where I am, like supplements drives me nuts. There's a debate I've been having forever. Um, but they're, mostly it's just say, you can relax, right? You know, there, there isn't this definitive answer. On the contrary, the evidence is kind of all over the place, right? And, and you can kind of step back from, from, from the noise. So, you know, thank you for that question, because... Um, I hope, I hope that theme emerges. And, and the other thing is um, in the Canadian version of the, of the book, um, it's called, I'm going to hold up the Canadian version. It's called Relax, Damn It. <laughs> and, uh, and the reason I, I have that in the Canadian version is it's kind of poke fun of myself. It's actually playing on this exact point, right? That, and in, it, but I still think we still captured in the British version because you got that noise there and I'm telling you to relax. So I, I do think, it's a really important point and it, and it, and it really about, about listening and having conversation. Very well answered. Um, okay, penultimate question from Anonymous. Uh, if you could have the ear of the G7, which is of course is going on around now, or, or any government, what are some of the issues that you would tackle immediately? What's one of the most urgent things? I, well, there's so many things. I mean, I, um, so, but I'm gonna be, I'm gonna use my own confirmation bias here, my own passions. Uh, and it's going to be about misinformation. You know, I, I think that what we are seeing now, and, 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 it's, and it's a good news story, 
that we are see I've been studying this area for decades and I've never seen anything like the misinformation that's being spun, but also the response to it. You are seeing the World Health Organization, the National Health Service, the CDC, the NIH, the Public Health Agency of Canada. Everyone is taking this very, very seriously now. Uh, and that is fantastic news, right? And so I, I think that I would say, don't stop. Don't make this a pandemic thing. Uh, make it something that, that is a legacy of, of the pandemic, that we recognize the, the adverse impact of misinformation, of fake news, uh, of, of disinformation, the impact that it has. Uh, and then we also recognize uh, the role of good science, good independent science, you know, funding good independent science uh, and having the institutions that foster public trust uh, in, in those institutions. And now I know I'm picking a topic I'm passionate about and there's other things that need to be tackled as climate change. You know, there's, we need more diversity and equity in the world. Uh, but I think the misinformation is part of that story. And, and I, hope, I hope that how we tackle it uh, lives on. Right. It, this is something that go, lives on. And because this is, Luke, this is going to be a battle. It's not just today. It's not just tomorrow. This is a struggle that we're going to have for a very, very long time, especially given the rise of these disruptive communication technologies. It's, it's, it's going to be a real challenge. And by the way, it's a challenge that we all can be involved in, all of us. We've just started this program called Science Up First, hashtag Science Up First. And I invite everyone to join, whether it's on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. It's a very simple mission. We wanna, we wanna share the good content on all of those platforms. So, so please join us in our Go Science fight, uh, become part of this, this, the answer to this, this real profound challenge. Fantastic answer. And actually it ties into sort of the last question, which is from me, which is you are sort of aggressively enthusiastic and optimistic, despite the fact that you spent so much time looking at misinformation how what why how do you stay optimistic why why are you optimistic um you know so it, it can be tough because you know the hate mail you know this year alone i've gotten death threats i'm being sued by an anti-vaxxer um uh, in a real you know real <laughs> serious case and it, it can be tough it can be tough but you know what i the, I, I really do believe and, and i think the research backs this up you know most people want to be accurate most people, you know, they don't have some nefarious agenda. Yes, those people are out there and they're inferior, nefarious agenda. Um, most people want to do what's best for themselves, their community um, and their family. Uh, and that gives you hope, right? And the other thing is that there is this wonderful, fantastic community, people like you, Luke, that are, that's emerging in, in the fight against misinformation. It's a fantastic, you know, it's a fun community. It's a community that's passionate about this stuff. You have all these different voices from you know, different kinds of communities getting involved. Uh, and so I, I think that makes it not only um, worthwhile, but, but a real joy. And so, as I said, I, you know, I invite everyone to become part of this community and, and let's get through it together. Oh, well, what a, what a way to, to wrap up. Sadly, sadly, we have to wrap up there. Um, as mentioned earlier, do check out Tim's new book, Relax, A User's Guide to Life in the Age of Anxiety, which is out now. Uh, and do head over to uh, the How to Academy website for more exciting speakers over the next few months. Speaking of exciting speakers, Tim, thank you so much for your fascinating talk. And thank you, audience, for tuning in and all of your brilliant questions. Uh, we hope to see you all very soon. Stay healthy and safe. And Tim, I'll give the final word to you. Well, I'd like to end by just saying thank you very much for those great questions. Thank you, Luke, and to the How To uh, uh, group for uh, allowing me this opportunity. And please uh, stay safe, everyone.